want to welcome Elder Larry Lawrence, who's just joined us and from whom we'll be hearing uh, later in the program and whom I will introduce to you formally uh, shortly. And the first presentation and discussion this afternoon says Elder Robert Wood, and that's apparently me. So I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes. Uh, in your book, you will find some, uh, some, some uh, copies of the overheads. You don't need to look at those now. Look at them later, because I'm not going to talk to them directly and sequentially. But I think they are self-explanatory, and you can, uh, in fact, look at, them, uh, look at them later. My subject is religious tolerance. And I can think of no better way to begin than citing the words of George Washington. In 1790, President Washington uh, sent a letter to the congregation at Toro Synagogue, the oldest synagogue in America, in Newport, Rhode Island. And he wrote, the citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. George Washington defined as, be as well as anybody has ever defined the very essence of tolerance, not as a, a concession which is granted by one social class or group, or a social indulgence of society as a whole, but something which is the right of every individual to, in fact, to enjoy toleration. Now, toleration sometimes has a negative connotation, particularly today. It did not in the 19th or the 18th century. Tolerance had a very positive, in fact, notion. John Locke, the father of the Enlightenment itself, in his letter on toleration said, I esteem the toleration to be the chief characteristic mark of the true church, instituted to the regulating of men's lives according to the rules of virtue and piety. Tolerance is intimately related to, on the one hand, religious liberty, about which we spoke this morning, and secondly, to the cultural predispositions and the historical memories of the people. By the way, people often remember many, many things that never happened. And on the basis of those historical memories, they, in fact, develop a certain sense of grievance and injustice which often translates into intolerance itself. Now, the ways of intolerance are many. They are both of a secular variety and of a religious variety. Intolerance of a secular variety ex would, would exclude religious motivation, demonstration, and public policy justification from the public square. Religious intolerance imposes religious conformity in matters of belief and practice by social pressure, acts of violence, or governmental fiat. The critical issues that we face in matters of tolerance is, first of all, can freedom of conscience and association be justified within the faith tradition as well as according to secular standards of human rights. That is to say, can the secularists and those of a religious mind live together allowing and encouraging true freedom of conscience and association? And secondly, can we formulate rules 
social rules for human behavior, including sexual norms and marriage, established by the faith tradition, can, can, can they be reconciled with a latitude for choice arising from other religious or secular bodies? Unfortunately, tolerance is on the decline throughout most of the world. In a recent Pew, found, a Pew Research Center uh, study, they surveyed 198 countries and found out that hostilities ha are up, religious hostilities and secular hostilities are up in every major region except the Americas, about which I'll say some words later. And the sharpest increase in intolerance is recorded in the Middle East, but there are significant increases in the Asia Pacific region with China edging into the high category of intolerance for the first time. 29% of countries that they surveyed have a high or very high level of government restrictions and Europe has the biggest increase in the medium level of government restriction. In terms of both governmental policies and social hostilities, restrictions are high or very high in 43% of the countries surveyed. Of the world's 25 most populous countries, Egypt, Indonesia, Russia, Pakistan, and Myanmar, Burma, have the highest level of overall restrictions. But what about intolerance within our own society? We indeed are going through, as has been mentioned several times, massive social and cultural changes, many of which are leading to disturbing signs of increasing intolerance. This has been related by many to the fact that our civil society is shrinking. Civil society is all the things that we do in our private, individual, and collective capacities aside from government programs. Those programs, those civil at civil society, is actually declining even as there is a growing bias toward the public provision of the general welfare rather than a private provision of the general welfare. That, in fact, is leading to a certain hostility to religious practices, to, in effect, religious programs apart from control or direct administration by government agencies themselves. That itself has led to a kind of intolerance of religion in general. Also, we have seen a disaffiliation of many, particularly in the younger generation, from attachments to uh, religious groups of one sort or another, and which has led to an interesting phenomenon of indifference. Unfortunately, when, you have, when people are indifferent about religion, they often turn their eyes the other way when there are sure signs of intoler intolerance. Indeed, one-third of Americans believe, in a recent poll, that the First Amendment goes too far in granting freedom, including the freedom of religion, which is an increase from 13% in 2012. Think of that. It's an increase from 13% in 2012 in two years to nearly a third of Americans believing that there's too much liberty under the First Amendment to the Constitution. So in fact, there are signs that there may indeed both be both secular and religious, if you will, uh, intolerance within our own society. Now, <clears throat> intolerance is not a new phenomenon. Uh, sometimes I go through a long description of the pagans and then the Christians. I haven't got time to do that today. But I, let me go back a few years, uh, barely remember it myself, to 303 A.D. <laughs> that was when the last great pagan persecution took place under Diocletian. And it was horrible. It was a horrible persecution of the Christians in that year. But in 1313, the emperor, Constantine, 
issued the Edict of Toleration, one of the most far-minded and noble documents ever proclaimed, in which he allowed complete and utter freedom of religion, including to Christianity itself, without requiring the kind of religious devotion to the emperor which had been required in Roman law theretofore. It was a remarkable thing. But it disappeared beginning in 325 and the Council of Nicaea, reinforced by the later Council of Constantinople in 381, when shockingly a Christian orthodoxy and an intolerant orthodoxy was established, which in effect forbid any deviation from the principles of the Nicene Creed and indeed the principles of the Council of Constantinople. And there entered into the Christian tradition a persecuting and intolerant spirit, which in fact was very much separate from what we see as freedom of conscience and assembly. And when the Reformation came, it did not get much better. The Reformation was actually a battle over who was to establish Christian orthodoxy. It was not a battle over freedom of religion. Now, fortunately, the cunning of history is such that whatever your intent, sometimes it comes out better than you, than in fact anyone should have expected. So the Protestant Reformation is indeed an advance in freedom of conscience and toleration, but that was not the intent of indeed the great Protestant reformers. And of course, you remember the great culmination in the Thirty Years' War. The end of that war in 1648, however, uh, did not lead to a declaration of toleration, but basically led to the principle that whatever the religious uh, association or connection of the ruler, that would be the religion of the people. So if you didn't like it in a Catholic confession, you had to move to a Protestant confession. So not precisely what you would call toleration. Indeed, the great, the great revolution came in the 18th century, the so-called Age of Enlightenment. Those who were the founders of that enlightenment actually were profoundly religious, including John Locke, who was considered the father of the enlightenment though it did take a very secular and rationalistic uh, uh, orientation, it literally opened the door for, in fact, the notion of true toleration of opinion. And indeed, in a very remarkable way, the United States became the meeting of John Winthrop, one of the Puritan forefathers, and of Thomas Jefferson. And somehow out of that mix, there developed a society, our own, which had perhaps the greatest sense of religious toleration in all of human history. Now, if that's a little bit the history, and by the way, as, as various groups came to the United States, whether they were Calvinists or Lutherans or Catholics, there was a magnificent transformation process that took place. A Polish Catholic or a Genevan Calvinist are not like an American Calvinist or an American Catholic. Something in our culture and a basic in our basic law developed, transformed those who came, and they developed a sense of mutual toleration of each other, which is exemplified so well indeed in the First Amendment to the Constitution. So indeed, this society indeed realized something, uh, for the first time, something which had never been possible in all of human history. Now, if you look at another great tradition, the Islamic tradition, in one sense, the great problem of Islam is that, uh, well, I'm putting it in simple terms, a bunch of lawyers got a hold of it. In, in the ninth and 10th century, the Sunni lawyers decided to define and freeze the faith. And they decided this is what the faith is, and there could be no further interpretation of the faith. Interestingly enough, the Shia tradition actually rejected that. Uh, but the Sunni tradition, the dominant tradition, basically, in effect, froze the faith. 
In Christianity, even during its most intolerant period, there was, in fact, a, 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 a possibility of toleration and therefore a possibility of the enlightenment itself. That possibility really grew from two things which Islam did not confront. The first thing was, in fact, when Islam spread, it spread into empty spaces, spaces which were either empty or they were not governed effectively, whereas Christianity spread within the Roman Empire. And therefore, very quickly, the Christians developed a notion of the separation of church and state as being two different social spheres. And that persisted all through the Middle Ages itself. Whereas for Islam, there was an identity between the religion and the state because of the circumstances in which it arose. Beyond that, Christianity developed a theory of interpretation of scriptures, which the Islamic tradition pretty much shut down as a result of the events of those Sunni attorneys, which I mentioned. Actually, they were more, they're basically more scholars than attorneys. In any case, the fact of the matter is, through interpretation, Christianity broke out of its straitjacket and basically had a wider view of, of doctrine and practice uh, than you were going to find in Islam itself. And by the way, that in and of itself, aside from all the other things that I could mention, led to a tension a built-in tension between the Islamic tradition and the Christian tradition. I, uh, some years ago, a few years ago, there was a, a man by the name of Wilford McClay, who's at the University of Tennessee, a Christian scholar who was invited to go to Turkey and participate in a conference and uh, at an Islamic center in Istanbul. And in the course of the discussion, he was asked the question by, a, uh, by an Islamic scholar, how can it be love for you or me or anyone to permit another person, someone we love, to believe something we know to be false? By the way, that was a question that could have been posed by a number of Christians throughout the Middle Ages and later and during the Re Reformation itself. If we have the truth, how can I permit you, if I truly love you, to embrace falsehood? And uh, Professor McClay said that was the question that gave him the greatest pause because he realized that that question was the foundation of a dialogue between his tradition and the tradition of Islam. And if he couldn't answer it, there'd be no further dialogue. The answer he gave was, the commitment to non-coercion flows from a theologically grounded commitment to the fundamental and intrinsic dignity of each individual person, and thus to the necessity of letting that person come to God freely in a disposition of love in the manner of God's desiring. We were lucky in that dialogue that we did not have a State Department representative there giving the answer. Because the, the State Department representative would have said something about human rights. And that would not have connected with that Islamic scholar. But the answer that Professor McClay gave it was an answer within faith traditions and therefore engaged a genuine dialogue. I am persuaded that if we are to have a dialogue, it cannot be within the secular tradition. It can only be done within the tradition of faith itself. So when we speak uh, with those of other faith, we need to operate within that tradition of faith and particularly when we're dealing with our brothers and sisters in the Islamic tradition itself. The key issue for Islam remains, however, that they have had no enlightenment. They've had no age of reason. They have not broken loose from the Sunni uh, lawyers who froze 
the Islamic faith. Interestingly enough, as I said, alluded to earlier, there are elements within the Shia tradition which actually might open up that dialogue. But ultimately, the great issue is going to be, in terms of the world of Islam, is for it to somehow come to the same conclusion that Wilford McClay came to, and that is there must be an element, there must be a substantial element of freedom in the choice of one's religious commitments and associations. Some years ago, I had a, a good friend, an, a Saudi officer, and we were talking about toleration, and he said that, he said, we're very, very tolerant, he said, within Saudi Arabia. How many of you have been to Saudi Arabia? Did, did you notice that? <laughs> we were very tolerant in Saudi Arabia. He said, uh, you know, if you, uh, we, uh, if, if you come from a faith tradition, uh, we uh, will not leave you, al we'll, we'll leave you alone as long as whatever you do, you do within the confines of your own home. And, uh, and, uh, and, and do not, in effect, attempt to go public at all with uh, what you believe. But we're not gonna, we're not gonna punish you for, in effect, belonging uh, by practicing your faith within the privacy of your own home. And I remember saying to him, well, that's a very different definition of tolerance. I said, uh, well, could I, uh, so I couldn't hold a public Christian service in Saudi Arabia, so no way. I said, and I couldn't, in effect, take my good Muslim friends and say, let me, t you have a wonderful tradition, let me see if I can add to it, in the words of President Hinckley. He said, no, no, you don't do that either. And so, was, but he thought that he, that there was a, that they, he lived within a tolerant society because, in fact, they provided enclaves. You cannot have an enclave mentality and have a true mutual respect and toleration for each other. And the key issue of our time is to allow that. Now, the problem is not simply with other faith traditions, even within the Christian faith tradition itself, but the problem also has to do with secular authority. To a substantial degree, secular authority many elements of secular authority would drive religious religion out of the public square. I've, uh, I don't know how often you've, uh, you've heard the, the argument that uh, when you're talking about public policy and you bring to bear upon that discussion your religious faith, and how many have said that's illegitimate? You can, you can only discuss public policy in secular terms. You cannot discuss it in terms of your religious commitment. Elder Cook, whom we're gonna hear from in, in shortly, said in our increasingly unrighteous world, it is essential that values based on religious belief be part of the public discourse. Moral positions informed by a religious conscience must be accorded access to the public square. And so in a sense, real tolerance is if we can speak openly with each other. Coming from our beliefs and our traditions and which we will mutually respect. Now ultimately, public law, as I alluded to earlier, must be reflective of the spectrum of opinion in our society without in effect coercing any one group or another to yield to in effect that which in fact is of a creedal, a creed, a foundation of creed that goes beyond that itself. That in fact requires that we indeed in the scriptural terms be wise as servants and harmless as doves. There is no group, by the way, <laughs> more involved in the issue of religious toleration than you. Just to be a chaplain, <laughs> as you well know, indicates you have to have a profound understanding of toleration. Toleration does, in fact, mean that we can talk to each other with mutual respect. We can explain. We can expound. We can even try to persuade. But we have to do it within a framework which in effect, which is non-coercive, and in fact, in fact, including social coercion, as well as 
as political or uh, forceful coercion. And that, in fact, requires a skill and a sensitivity. But going back to John Locke, he said that is the very definition of the true religion. Do you recall the word that is used over and over again by the Savior and is used in our missionary program? What do we do when we preach the gospel? How do we phrase that? We invite. We invite. And we invite to, in effect, bring all that is good. We invite you to come. Listen. Don't rely on us. Rely on the voice of heaven through the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. I think John, Rock, John Locke was right. That is the sign of the true religion, which in effect invites and then relies upon the witness of the Spirit to confirm what we say. I have now a, a calling in the church, which is the hardest calling I've ever had. Uh, I've been stake president. I've been a bishop been a regional representative in Area 70, general authority, you know, done all kinds of things. They're all a piece of cake compared to being a ward mission leader, <laughs> which is what I now am. You know, I've often said I'd like to write a book, Free Agency and How to Enforce It. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, but the missionary, working with the missionaries has reinforced for me once again that what we need to do is to offer what we have without denigrating anybody else or making negative comparisons. Invite and then, and then testify. Expound. Don't Bible bash. Expound and then say, find out for yourself by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. If that sentiment ever took hold throughout our whole society, indeed, there would be no danger to religious liberty. And we would have a society characterized by civility and, above all things, by love. You are in the forefront of that. May because of your, because of your labors, may, in fact, you express that love draw people into that sentiment and invite them to come unto God and to do so by virtue of the Spirit, that in fact you may do so. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.